Hi, ready for module number two? Here we go, targeting and reach. Let's keep building on the establishment of Facebook Business Suite and our setup and roll on in to audiences and ads manager. We're gonna look at boosted content, of course. That's our first area of advertising on the internet is promoted posts and boosted content. And then we're going to, of course, go beyond Facebook and Instagram and look at LinkedIn, Twitter, and Pinterest opportunities because they're pretty powerful too. And then what is our results? We did a little cross-platform challenge with a, a boosted um, showdown, and I'll show you which one performed the best. And then, of course, planning for paid content success. So utilizing that budgeting tool that I showed you at the, in the intro module and, um, and, of course, just having a better at-a-glance look at your ads and boosted posts for the month. Okay, so the very, very most important part of our audience or of our uh, digital ad campaigns is the audience that we're targeting. If we have the greatest message, but we're sending it to the wrong group of people, it's not going to perform. And any campaign that has ever resonated, and any organic content as well, has landed on the right people. They have a highly receptive audience, and that literally is the most important metric for success, period. If the people want what you're serving up and they're excited to hear what you have to say, then they're going to act on it, and your results will be great. So we talk about ADA a lot at social school, as do many marketers and salespeople. And of course, this is the awareness, awareness, interest, desire, or decision, and then action funnel that is age old. It is usually referred to in a sales context, but we often talk about it in an SEO context when people move through your website and they find, find you at different stages of their buyer journey in their audience um, journey, if you will, as well if you will, as well. Uh, the customer journey is basically a nice way of saying the ADA funnel. If we turn it on its side, customers or, or prospects go from awareness to action and we have to show up for them along the way. Well, what about the ADA funnel as it relates to our ads and their role throughout the buyer journey? We talk about people being at the top of the funnel, as I alluded to earlier, to the middle of the funnel and then down to the bottom of the funnel. And when we're in that top of funnel awareness stage, we again, don't really know much about this company. We've maybe never heard of them before. We've certainly never followed their posts or engaged with their content or you know, been on their website. So we're new. And as marketers or business owners, it is integral that we're constantly putting people into the top of our funnel as new leads, because most of us don't have the luxury of constantly repeating content or uh, customers without any attrition or any fall off. Usually there's some turnover in our customers and we have to find new ones at all times. So in the middle, of course, we have our warm leads. This is kind of more specific content. So now we're serving up messaging to people who know us. You're gonna talk very differently to a stranger than you would to someone who lives down the street from you, who you've met a few times and they've read your e-newsletter. Um, and of course, if we're talking about how to get people further from there, well, we wanna make sure that it's the nurturing kind of content or the engaging sort of stuff that makes them wanna take the very next step with us and click through to our website, perhaps. Well now, sorry, but you're a hot lead. You've been on my site three times. You bought from me a month ago. You, you know, read my e newsletter every single week. I have ways of knowing because of my pixel or because I'm just paying attention to my stats on my e newsletter and bumping you or tagging you with someone who opens it every week. Well, of course, I'd be remiss in not utilizing that data and doing something with it. And the companies that get you to buy and show up often in your feed or in your inbox are doing exactly that. They're utilizing the data that you're giving to them and uh, utilizing it in a way that gets you to take the next action that they want you to take. So when we go back to the, uh, the building of the audiences, which is so important that again, allows us to reach people and engage with them at whatever stage they're at, we at Social School have divided things into, as I mentioned, cold, warm, and hot. But Facebook, when, they are, when you are using their audience building tool, refers to them as saved, lookalike, and custom. So let's first start with the so-called saved. It's a bit of a weird name, but it refers to audiences that are built on those cold, top of funnel, pretty vague factors. I don't really have a choice if I'm going into a new market 
or I'm suddenly targeting a new group of buyers, or I have an entirely new product offering and I'm kind of stabbing in the dark as to who this is perfectly suited for, or I'm just starting with a big audience so I can narrow it down from there, I'm going to have to utilize pretty broad factors like geographics, ge 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 geographics, <laughs> location, demographics, age, gender, maybe income or occupation if I can get some of those factors uh, available to me. Also behaviors, interests, not the really deep kind of emotional um, uh, behaviors like I, you know, opened this email and therefore send me something else, but more just like, you know, they are expats from Australia who are engaged to be married in the next six months. Wow. Okay. Well, now I know a little bit about you, but these are all based on interests and behaviors and top of funnel data sets in Facebook business manager. So it is, even though some of those sound really specific, they're still kind of vague and they're not nearly as powerful as some of our other audiences, but they're necessary starting points so that we can slowly get tighter and tighter from there. If you start out advertising to a group of 100,000 people in a town or a city of a million, great. You started with a 10% audience. That, that could be a good rule of thumb, which a lot of people utilize. Well, you've got to know that of those to that 10% sector of that city, um, you've still got to narrow it down to like 1% perhaps of people that are actually going to buy from you. So that warm audience, you want to get that down to 20 or 30,000. And then that hot audience might be five or 10,000 people that you're really engaging with and spending money on to get them to purchase. So of course, after saved or cold comes warm, and this is where Facebook calls it lookalike. You don't have to build a lookalike audience as you're warm. There's other ways to build a warmer audience. Could just be a more specific cold or saved audience. But we can think of it this way if we look at Facebook's hierarchy of audience building. And these are those who may know who we are. You know, they've liked or shared our content. They've watched our videos, perhaps. They've maybe engaged with our ads. Um, they've read our email. They've been um, maybe kind of circling around us, but they haven't yet taken any bigger steps. They are in the middle of the ADA funnel. They're in that interest and decision-making factor or uh, stage. They're trying to decide what car to buy and they're still doing research. They're trying to decide what dentist would be great for their family and they're still looking around. And they're very impressionable at this stage. So this is where we've got to show up, not just to, hey, we're alive, to, hey, ready to buy. That middle nurture stuff is so important. And then that hot audience, which Facebook calls custom, we call hot. These are those who have absolutely engaged with us before. They know our business. They maybe subscribe to our e-newsletter. They've been on our website, either the entire thing or a specific page. They've put items in their cart, but haven't purchased, or they've bought from us before. And we want to keep them coming back for more for repeat purchases and referrals. And thus, you know, we'd be remiss in not continuing to engage them in a way that they want to be spoken to, not like strangers, um, but those who have already, you know, they're part of our fold. So this can generally be the least expensive group to reach because we're not pushing it out there to hundreds of thousands of people that aren't going to click. Our cost per click should be lower because we know that there's a good chance they're going to engage with this content. They're going to click on it. And thus really savvy advertisers will spend a lot more up in the top of funnel, sometimes as much as 60 to 70% and then 20 to 30% and then 10% of their budget. But it depends on, you know, what your budget is and um, just how many people you need to reach in each of those stages and how expensive it is to advertise in your particular market. If it's really crowded and you're selling car ads and you're trying to establish your new dealership at the top of funnel in the city of Toronto, it's going to cost you a lot for cold ads. But maybe in year two or year three where you're more established, you can shift some of that budget down further down the funnel. All right, so <laughs> if you're ready, it's, um, it's a great time to go into your business manager and build them out. And this is what it would look like. And before you do that, I want to remind you that there are some great demo videos for you here. So we have extensive videos. One is a cold audience build where we use those, uh, the saved audience. And we use interests, behaviors, geographical and demographical factors to build a really powerful saved audience cold. Then there's a video for the warm, the lookalikes and other types of lookalikes you might want to build or other types of warm audiences, I should say. And then there's the demo for the hot. 
very, um, and, and you don't have to have a pixel in website traffic. There's other types of hots you can create. And then the fourth video bonus is what we like to call our micro geo targeting audience, which is a really cool, um, type of audience. I would call it hot, maybe warm, but you drop a pin on a certain area and you can literally narrow in as tight as a single city block, a single building, um, uh, and then further target based on the interests of the people staying in that hotel or that visited that conference center for that conference that you were too cheap to exhibit at or just didn't want to, or maybe for a uh, competing institution or school or maybe for a uh, job or a hiring that you're targeting nurses at a particular hospital, we can get so hyper targeted on our geographical factors. You can call it geofencing if you want. Um, and we do this uh, in Facebook in a really powerful way using pin drops. So there's a fourth video for you there. That's that micro geo targeting. I encourage you to check that out. So again, just as an overview here, where you would find your saved audiences, you're in audience manager, which is within business suite. And, um, you're able to create an audience. There's that blue button. And the first one you want to start with is the saved. And it's pretty self-explanatory as you'll see in the demo video, it walks you through every single step. You want to know in advance what those interests are, what those, um, variable factors are so that you are not creating a ton of saved audiences without any strategy behind them. You want to maybe have a set of three or four where there's one factor that changes. So I have a beautiful set of four saved audiences and every single one is targeting Albertans and they are female cause that's primarily my audience. And they're, um, you know, interested in digital marketing, social media, one of their behavioral factors is that they are a Facebook page admin. So other things that I can utilize in my interests or my industry factors that Facebook's allowing me to choose from as I build this audience out. And then my variable, if you remember in science grade seven, you have your controlled variables and you have your, um, that other one that moves that we'll call the variant. <laughs> so I forget the name of it. So the variant here is maybe age. I'm going to have my four audiences and this one will be 25 to 30 year olds, 31 to 36 year olds, 37 to 42 year olds and 43 to 50 year olds. That's my variant. So I have four powerful saved audiences that don't overlap with one another. You'll see that all in the demo video. Next up, we go to type three. We bump ourselves down to the hot custom audiences because we can't create a lookalike audience until we've built a hot audience. And that's why lookalike is warm because it's built off of that hot with somehow a slight variation. So I'm going to build a hot audience in Regina of people that have been on my website in the last seven days. And then I'm going to go and create a similar audience in Winnipeg based on that audience. Facebook calls it a lookalike audience for that reason. It's not the exact people that have been on my site, but it's people who kind of act and engage with the same kind of content and elicit the same behaviors as that Regina audience. And therefore it's a pretty powerful warm audience for me to utilize in a new market. So we go from cold audiences, then we build our hots, and then you could reverse into your warms and build out some of those lookalike audiences. Okay. So what type of custom audiences can we build as you will see in the demo video? Well, here's two examples. The first on the left is a website pixel based audience. So when Facebook asks me, what is my audience source? So they're saying, okay, who are you? What, what, how are you uh, targeting these people or where are you pulling them from? And I'm going to say my source is my website. And I go through the, the process there and I utilize social school pixel named accordingly. And I say, that's my um, source is the pixel that has been tracking people on my website and remembering their IP address and sending it back to my audience builder. And I say, I want them to, uh, people who have visited a specific site, uh, page on my site. In this case, it's my forward slash shop page. So they made it that far. But then I'm going to also use an exclusionary audience there. You can see it, um, of people that did not visit forward slash. Thank you. If you see at the very bottom of that second little, uh, graphic there. So I know that they visited shop, but they didn't make it to checkout, which because my checkout page, my redirect is called. Thank you. Thanks for buying. And that's, I have that page in place mostly for this reason. Also, cause I want to say thank you, but it's very strategic when using advertising. 
because of course I don't want to keep serving ads to people that already bought this product. That's a huge waste of money and just plain dumb. So that's one type of uh, powerful hot audience that again, you can go watch the video demo of at being built in real time. Well, what if I don't have a pixel uh, on my website or I don't have much traffic yet going to my website. So how could I possibly start retargeting those five people with ads and Facebook won't even let me unless my audience is bigger. Well, I could use another source like a Facebook source in this case. Sure. Instagram account. And I'm going to say include people that have met any of the following criteria or some. And in this case, I'm going to say everyone who engaged with my professional account or my Instagram business page. And that includes, you know, they visited it, they booked an appointment, they commented on a post, they liked a post, they shared a post, they bookmarked a post or an ad. So pretty broad. And that happened within the last 90 days, let's say. Well, now I have a different type of custom audience where again, it's based on engagers. So sometimes when I'm building out hot audiences, I'll call it traffic audiences, or I'll call it engagers. Those who have engaged, I'm going to retarget you with an ad because why wouldn't I let's keep talking. And then we go back to type two, of course, the lookalikes, which you'll see in the demo video. And I choose my source and this one is dead easy to build because now I'm going to say, use the custom source of website traffic of people who lived in Regina and were on my shop page, but didn't make it to checkout within the last seven days. And I'm going to target, but let's target those same types of people in Winnipeg. So the lookalike audience gets built really simply. Now ads manager is the next logical place for us to go when we've built out our audiences and we feel really good about our audience set. As I mentioned, we're going to revisit our audiences regularly and we're going to be really aware of what they are, what, what exists in my audience manager. What's my list of audiences. It's one of my most powerful assets. And if I don't stay on top of it and they hundreds of them exist and people don't know who's who and what's what I'm going to have a really tough time boosting content quickly or creating ad campaigns strategically. So the nat natural place to go from here, of course, would be ads manager, but we're not going to do that just yet. Um, but I want to introduce it as exactly what it sounds like here. So it's a starting point for running sophisticated ad campaigns. And I say sophisticated because they're the next level. Once you're boosting content well, which we're going to look at next, then you go in and you start to graduate into ads manager and running ad campaigns where you get to pick all sorts of placements on third party sites, just Instagram stories, just the newsfeed messenger plus stories. And you get to create really powerful ad types. Unlike when we're boosting content, we're just boosting our existing square posts or Instagram reels or whatever. But in this case, we can go in and do some really cool stuff in ad campaigns. So we'll get there and it exists in your home screen. Again, you'll see ads right there. And, uh, and then of course, creating our ad campaigns can be really, really fun. So we're going to start, um, as I mentioned with the promoted post. So let's go back to, this is what I mentioned in module one, the two ways to uh, boost our, or to advertise on the internet. And the first one is this boosted content and some rules for it to get us started. So we want to link most of our content to our site. It goes without saying that when we're creating content on any kind of social platform, we want to ensure that we are linking it back to our website and not to like Buzzfeed or, you know, McLean's magazine or some other site on the internet. We want that traffic. That's half the reason or a big reason why we create original content in the first place is to drive traffic to our site, which we believe so wholeheartedly in. We feel so good about the moment someone lands there, they know exactly what to do and we guide them along their journey to action. But we can't do that until we get them there. So really linking most of your content to your site is a no brainer. And as an added bonus, of course, that provides great SEO value because we're driving traffic and the more people that visit our site, more popular it becomes. And in Google's eyes, it has more domain authority and trust. Then it rises up the rankings. Next up, we want to avoid linking to other sites. Similarly, I should try not to create content that is sending someone, um, you know, anywhere else and, and thus wanting to create, maybe repurpose an existing or trending news story as my own. And that's what we call newsjacking. 
So if something is happening in the world that I need to weigh in on, whether it's interest rates because I'm a mortgage broker or hair trends because I'm a hairstylist, I'd be smart to gather a few pieces of information or, or stats, facts, figures, latest news, make it into my own, even a three paragraph blog or a, a LinkedIn article. It doesn't have to be a novel. And I link that, the content that I'm posting about it to that article wherever I've posted it. So really thinking about how you can create your own content, hijack some of the, or newsjack some of the trending stories that are out there right now. And, uh, and again, have a fantastic um, social post as well as SEO value. So we want to boost most of our posts. This is the pay to play environment that we live in. And again, if we have very low organic reach on our business page posts, which most of us do just by default, thanks to the algorithm and the fact that Facebook wants us to pay to get our content seen. But remember, they're providing us with this free content tool. And if we do it well, we can do it really affordably if we wrap our heads around the fact that it's an opportunity, not a pain in the butt and that we've been lied to that we have to now pay to play. Um, we can reach non-followers. We can, you know, get our content seen, run fantastic sales campaigns, etc. Understand who we want to reach. And this goes back to, you know, some of the customer avatar and prospect building that we did in the earlier courses in this certificate program, where we really had to get specific on who our audience is. What do they need from us? I think I banged everybody over the head with this a lot in this, um, in the, in the course where we talked about deepest desires and fears and pain points and solving those for people. The moment they see your Facebook post, the moment they land on their website, they feel a sense of relief or is it joy or is it excitement or is it, you know, pride? What is it that they're looking for that you can solve or answer for them? And you have to know them and what those pain points are or desires before you can go ahead and create the kind of content that's going to solve any problems for them. And that's your job. It's not to celebrate you and your company and your accomplishments and your schooling. It's to speak my language as your prospect or customer. It's to stand shoulder to shoulder with me, show that you understand me and then solve my problems as fast as you can before I lose interest. Um, we have, a, you know, additional information on this um, in our audience building lab. So if you want to go into that, that's our, in our 360 series, it's course number 304. And it's a really important piece of the puzzle. If you feel like you need more on that, we want to find the right time to post or to boost that post. Um, and that data is available to us in the back end of our Facebook and Instagram accounts and LinkedIn and Twitter and Pinterest. And, um, this is what will tell us when people are online and what day of the week they're most online. And you know, give us a good starting point as to when we should be boosting and getting that money in and behind the algorithm. To, so the algorithm says, oh, hey, when this content goes live at 4.40 a.m. on a Tuesday, because my, cut, my people come online at 5 a.m. heavily between 5 and 7 a.m. on Tuesdays, that it's gonna have that initial boost behind it, that, that money essentially to say, hey algorithm, you need to serve this up to 3,000 people, not my usual three. And then the algorithm's gonna place it in all sorts of places. And if it's a quality post and it's done at the right time and gets an early amount of traction, well, it's gonna get seen by even more because Facebook will reward you for creating great content, both organic and paid, and your reach will go higher if it's a quality post. So we want to pre-boost our scheduled posts if we can for that similar reason. If I'm scheduling a bunch of content in advance, good for me, maybe I'm using Facebook Creator Studio to do so, as we talked about in course number two, content writing and publishing, and um, or it's also in our, um, our tools and tech lab, which is course number 204 in the 360 series. But if I'm scheduling all my posts in there, as opposed to Hootsuite, Buffer, Planoly, a third party tool, which can be great. The reason we're loving Creator Studio so, so much right now is not only do we have a calendar view and draft view and scheduled view and all these things and fantastic tools to create those scheduled posts, but I can pre boost it to the exact audience I want to get this boost for how long, for how much, and, uh, and then of course get the data after the fact. 
So you can't pre-boost your post anywhere else, to my knowledge. And uh, it's a smart thing that the moment that thing goes live, again, it's got that boost behind it. So the algorithm sees it and, you know, gets it served up fast and far. A lot of times you can come back after the fact and boost a post and it'll prompt you to do so, but it's a junior way of doing it. You want it to get a lot of traction right when it goes live the very first time so that it's, it's current and it's, you know, going out there fast and furiously. So two ways to boost. There is what we like to call the short boost, also known as the lazy boost here at Social School. And then there's the long boost, which is the more strategic way to go, but it, it does take a little longer. And ta-da, there's a demo for this in your uh, course dashboard. So it is the short versus long boost demo, and it's gonna help make a lot of sense of this where I show you exactly both ways to go. But the short boost is just like it sounds like. We're boosting right from the front end. We're being a bit lazy about it and we're taking the bait where they say boost this post with that little blue button. If you haven't seen this before, push pause, go into your Facebook or your Instagram account, your business account, make sure you're logged in so that you see as you're scrolling your business feed or you're scrolling, yeah, your posts in your feed, you'll see that blue button and it says boost post, boost post, boost post. It wants you to spend money on it. It wants you to increase your reach. Or maybe you'll get a prompt sometime that says, hey, Kelly, this post is performing better than 85% of your other crappy posts. <laughs> Would you like to boost it for even more reach? And you're like, yes, here's $20. It didn't go anywhere. Oh, I have crappy audiences, that's why. But if we know in advance that our, we have a perfect audience for that boost or for that content, because we worked backwards when we created that content to say, yep, this is going to audience A, this one is perfect for audience B, and this one is perfect for audience C. And that might be my educational content, my insightful content, and my informational or, or um, entertaining content. Or it might be something to do with my home renovation business, with my commercial flooring business and with my residential flooring business. So I'm going to boost to those audiences appropriately or accordingly. So if we want to go this route, no problem. So long as we have audiences built in advance that we're very strategic about. It's easy, it's quick, it's foolproof. It's going to walk you through it really simply. You push boost posts from one of your posts. It then says to you, which audience do you want to boost it to? And then how much do you want to spend? It's pretty much, um, a, that's about it. You have less insights, less control, and lesser results sometimes, notably on longer spanning boost, is what we have found. Some people swear by the lazy boost. Others will say never ever should you boost a post from the front end because you don't have the same amount of data in the back end. Okay, well then what's the alternative? Oh, and here's, here's where it happens. So I'm in Facebook Business Suite. I'm in posts and stories, or maybe I'm in Creator Studio, which is a whole other window. If you wanna go find that, look in the demo of your setup, um, the setup video. So if I go in here, I can see my existing posts, or I can create a post, schedule it here, pre-boost it. But this is kind of where it's done, and, uh, and then it's pretty straightforward from there. So the long boost, this is where I would go into Ads Manager, which we'll look at in a minute in Module 3, and I'm going to create a campaign where my, my objective, which is the very first thing you declare when you're building an ad campaign, my inject objective is going to be engagement because what I'm looking for here is engagement on this particular post. So that's the objective that I've decided on and then I'm going to proceed through creating an ad campaign where I, I'm basically advertising that particular post. The pros, generally better results. You might get more reach, more return, more actions taken on that post, especially if it's a longer campaign. So if I was to do a short um, boost for seven days versus a long boost for seven days, we have found that we'll get better results on the long boost for seven days. But if it's a short boost for two days and a long boost for two days, we'll get better results on the short boost because it hits the algorithm faster sometimes we find when you just push boost post. If I go into Ads Manager and create a campaign where my objective is post engagement, but it's only a two day ad campaign, the algorithm doesn't have enough time to pick it up, do its learning phase, and then serve it up really well. So that's a factor to consider. 
The cons, it's a more complicated and lengthy process, so it just takes a little longer. If you're going to boost every post, the nice way to do it would be to schedule that month's worth of post, as we talk a lot about in course number two, and then pre-boost every single one as you go through a post engagement campaign. So I can, can pre-boost the long way multiple posts at once and now it's you know fairly easy and not quite as extensive so I've just got to allocate the time to do that right. You'll see this again in the demo video of the long boost we're in ads manager campaign objective post engage is post engagement pick your audience pick your budget pick your uh, duration and um, Bob's your uncle. You'll see then that ad campaign show up in Ads Manager in a different way. It is a campaign name with lots of data versus just the one right below it. If you can see that says post, post, post. Those are just boosted posts, much less information. And they're not because they're not built as a campaign. They're built as a one off post. All right, we are flying right along here. I encourage you to push pause and go view that video of the short versus long boost right now, just so that you have it in your head and you, you watch it while this information is fresh. Um, we're going to welcome you to create your audiences at the end of this module two, module number two, and then also consider boosting some posts. So now's your time to do that if you want. Uh, in the meantime, we will go and look at promoted content on other platforms. So if we've nailed our boosted content on Facebook and Instagram, or at least we think we have a handle on it, we know how to do it and how to build the audiences, doing so on LinkedIn and Pinterest and Twitter is not so difficult at all. And is it important? Well, yeah, for similar reasons. If a tree falls in the forest and nobody hears, does it fall? Is that the line? Oh boy. If you are creating content on LinkedIn and again, no one sees it from your business page, what's the point? Um, so yeah, you get the idea. Think about it, experiment with it, allocate budget if you can and consider some of these alternative platforms as a great place to promote your content because guess what? So few people are using them compared to uh, Facebook and Instagram campaigns. So let's look at what happens if our organic content on LinkedIn. So here's Entrepreneur Magazine who has 1.8 million followers, which is gigantic on LinkedIn. And um, they've, you know, putting up a post that, and I made sure that all of these posts had been live for at least 24 hours. And they got nine likes on that post. So with 1.7 million followers, you know their organic reach is tiny, because if a huge portion of those people saw this post, chances are they'd have several thousand likes. But to only have nine likes makes us realize that it got terrible organic reach and they didn't boost it. I can tell just by looking at it. Whereas smaller companies, Tableau Software or bigger company, RBC, we can see that that's promoted. It shows that little very uninvasive line that says promoted, which of course, I expect them to pro promote content to me. They're a big business. Why wouldn't they advertise? And we can see the difference. Lots of likes, lots of comments, and just, again, so much more visibility. If we could see the reach and the actual kind of, um, uh, yeah, impressions or reach of these posts, they'd be exponen exponentially higher as well. So in LinkedIn, we have ad campaigns and then we also have sponsored content. So it's not called promoted posts or boosted posts. They call it sponsored content. And um, what we do is we pay for it by 1000 clicks or per 1000 clicks. Whereas the ad campaigns want just like Facebook and Instagram, you've got various types, placements um, and payment models to choose from depending on your objective. And it's come a long ways. If we're looking at the sponsored content, that boosted post um, opportunity, it's an easy way to increase reach, target specific audiences um, with specific posts and articles, of course. Uh, reach non-followers, similarly. We have, a sim we have a generous display size right in the news feed, and uh, we can monitor our results, of course. Once it's live, it can't be edited because you know it's pulling from our inventory of live content already. So we create a post, then we boost it. Um, and we, we manage it through LinkedIn Campaign Manager. So linkedin.com forward slash campaign manager or to set this up, business.linkedin.com, similarity to Facebook. We create our ad account and then we go ahead and we create our audiences 
and we decide if we want to boost posts or create ad campaigns. Um, there's a lot of opportunities for ad campaigns as well. So that's the part B. If you want to graduate into ad campaigns on LinkedIn, if you go to LinkedIn and you look around at how many places you can advertise on that thing or that you're being targeted with ads, you'll be blown away. There's not just the sidebar ads. There's top banner ads. There's in uh, feed ads. There's um, in message ads. There is article ads. So many different places that we can reach people with paid content now on LinkedIn. Um, a note here, speaking of how you're being reached with paid content, ad transparency is just a really, really, uh, you know, nice evolution of some of these platforms, even though they still have many faults. Uh, we're back in Facebook here just to give you an idea of where to go and find out why you're seeing a certain ad. Why am I being targeted with this promoted post? Why am I seeing this ad campaign? Well, every business page now in Facebook uh, has a section called page transparency. We can see all the ads they're running. I can head on in to their ad library, among other things, and I can see the ads that they're running in different markets, who they're targeting, what they're saying, literally what the ad looks like. And beyond transparency for curiosity reasons, um, this is the best place to gather intel and ideas and inspiration about the ad campaigns that other people are running. If you wanna know what the hot ads, the, the format or the look and feel or the calls to action of the moment are for your competitors or for the leaders in your industry or your field or just straight up beautiful big businesses like Nike, head on into their ad transparency, look at their ad library, see what they're advertising to people in Korea, see what they're advertising to people in Canada. Um, and it can be a really great way to, uh, to look or to, to gather some intel and, and grow your own library. Likewise, with LinkedIn, we can see this as well. So if I'm in my newsfeed and I click on say Unilever's page or Procter & Gamble's page or RBC's page, I can head into their ads tab. So you've seen it probably when you go to someone's, you see the posts that a company's created. You also see their articles, images, documents, videos, and then I can see their ads right there. So it's pretty cool to be able to access this kind of information and utilize it however we need to. All right, over to Pinterest. Uh, similarly, numerous types of ads that we can run and not very well utilized in my humble opinion. I know this anecdotally because for one, I don't know many people that advertise on, on Pinterest and I ask a lot of businesses. And two, personally, I get served up a lot of the same ads over and over and over on Pinterest. So there might be some opportunity here for you to advertise on a less crowded highway, uh, a place where there isn't as much paid content and you might be surprised at how well it does. So we can promote our pins, again, pulling from our inventory of published pins and promote or boost those. We can create a carousel ad that shows up in the news feed of Pinterest and it looks like a pin, but it's a carousel ad that's really linkable and quite eye-catching. Um, we can, our app can be pinned if maybe we're um, promoting or, or selling an app. Uh, we can create video ads. So just like the other places, the other platforms, there's a lot of um, evolution here to Pinterest ad campaign types and uh, I encourage you to explore it. If you're in Canada, pinterest.ca forward slash business. If you're in the States, dot com, um, or just Google it, Pinterest business um, settings or dashboard, and um, you'll be able to create an account and uh, just move step by step through it. So similarly to Facebook and Instagram, we declare our objective, either is it awareness or is it consideration? And it's gonna be served up or optimized for people who are just looking, I'm just in the awareness phase, or maybe people that are looking in their search, they're more specific, you know, um, things that just would indicate they're ready to buy. So that's the consideration objective or buyer stage. Enter your campaign details. Um, and then of course your audience. So building out an audience, you won't have the same level of sophistication as you do in your audience building in Facebook business suite, but still quite a bit of targeting information and opportunity. Um, so walking through that, both audience building and targeting, and then adding interests. And of course, this is what Pinterest is all about. What are you interested in? That's what you're searching for generally. So there's lots of um, room there to get specific. 
And then you get to also choose keywords. So it's kind of like this like Google advertising aspect where we bring in the keywords that also are relevant for our um, business and our ad to increase our impressions, of course. We set our budget and our schedule. We optimize our delivery. So, you know, what do we want to be uh, bidding on if we want to play with that recommended number? And then, uh, you know, how fast that we want to spend that budget or slow. And then we choose the creative. So we add the pins to our ad group from our existing inventory. We create a selection of, this is kind of like Google ads here. We create basically a, a selection of pins that are going to be served up in that ad group. And hopefully we have incredible results. So I encourage you to play with that a little bit. Um, likewise, with everything we do, do your research by getting on the platform, paying attention as you scroll to how many ads you're served and what type of ads and click on them. <laughs> you're going to get retargeted with more pins and more ads from that company, but it's worth it for the research aspect. So click on the carousel ads, the video ads that autoplay. Take note of how often you're seeing the same ad. And of course, whether you're seeing great ads or any from your industry or people, you know, that would potentially be your competitors. And is there a platform here or a place for you to have some, some room? And remember, Pinterest is a massive search engine. This is the third most popular search engine from Google and YouTube. Then it's Pinterest. We go to Pinterest and we click on those pins like crazy and we get driven to websites. So it's a really great place and it's not always just the people you think that are on Pinterest. Be, take note of that. Finally, when we look at other places to boost our content, let's talk about Twitter. Similar to Pinterest and LinkedIn and Facebook and Instagram, it's come a long way. There are so many different things that we can now do in our Twitter ad campaigns and objectives than we, couldn't, than we could do in the last few years. They've finally gotten their act together here. So we can determine what our ad objective would be, whether that's more awareness. We want to just like promote our tweets and maximize the reach of our company and our message. Um, engagements. So perhaps we want to be promoting our posts or our tweets to the people that are really going to engage with us and we're going to get more retweets and likes and replies. And that's not just a popularity contest thing. That's important for our, for the algorithm to see just how, um, how you know well engaged with we are so that we get rewarded accordingly. There's not much of an algorithm at play in Twitter, but there is some um, there is something there. It's just not as strong of a filter of our content as on other platforms. Followers, we want to promote our account and grow our Twitter following. Website clicks, that's a fantastic ad objective for many of us, or perhaps app installs. So you get to pick. From there, we set up our Twitter campaign um, and it's really easy. It'll take you through that same path. Objective, choose your audience, bid, bid amount, uh, budget, how much do you want to spend? What's your duration? And then creative, what is it that you're saying? And, you know, load it up or pull from existing tweets. Okay, so we ended, or we're going to end this almost with a, a cross-platform promoted post challenge. This is where we decided to put them to the test and um, see. And of course, this depends on the time of year, the type of content, the duration of the campaign, etc. So take this with a grain of salt. But on a very generic boosted post challenge where we spent $10, our duration was only one day. So, mm, uh, advantage goes to the platform that has the fastest algorithm and the most engaged users at the right time that are going to pick up and run with that post and, um, and then, you know, drive down the cost. And the audience was uh, a Saskatchewan, so province-wide based marketing and small business audience of 18 to 24 year olds. So pretty broad um, and, uh, you know, top of funnel kind of cold awareness stuff. So which platform performed the best? I'm so glad you asked. Let's look. First of all, we had LinkedIn. So this promoted post or sponsored content, as they call it, uh, drove 174 impressions for $10, remember, over just 24 hours. Um, and the organic stats there were 206 impressions. So we had a bit more um, than that when we added in the sponsored and then just a few more that were organic. So combined... Um, it wasn't so bad. Uh, and then Instagram, what did we see? 2,500 people were reached, so much more impressive. 
and of course reach our individual people reach whereas impressions uh, combines multiple um, views of something uh, so we want to probably pay attention more to reach and that's not bad we can see just how many people uh, saw it and if we look to the left 79 percent weren't following us yet and um, and that's pretty good. We can also see that we got some some likes and some bookmarks in the top on the insights tab there, and uh, and a little bit more about the audience, so gender, etc. What about Facebook? Wow. <laughs> so for ten dollars over twenty four hours on Facebook, we reached twenty nine hundred people. We had forty post clicks. We can see just how much of our split was organic versus paid. So probably the paid results drove up the organic. I would bear, I would dare wager that if we hadn't spent any money and boosted this content at all, our organic reach would have been even less, maybe 50 people. But because it was performing well as a paid piece of content, our organic reach went up as well because Facebook thought, wow, this is decent performing content. People really like it. They're watching this video. They're sharing it with their friends. They're commenting on it. Thus, we're going to serve it up organically a little bit more as well because it's in our best interest to show people content that they want to see. So you can see it right there. Proof is in the pudding. In this case, Facebook came out on top and, uh, and performed really well. I would encourage you to try some of this on your own. And there's a lot of factors going on here. That 24 hour boost was really tight. Um, you know, to just do it on one post, same thing. It's just like, well, maybe that kind of content performs well on Facebook, but what about something totally different? LinkedIn might have come out a winner. Um, and maybe LinkedIn boosted um, or, or sponsored articles would just kill it because there's not as much competition for that. So just paying attention to all of those variants and factors is really important. That's where A-B testing comes in and sometimes it's A, B, C, D, E, F, G testing where you're playing with a few different factors. The audience could have made a big difference, the time of day, etc. Speaking of budgeting for success and testing and optimizing and iterating, uh, we really want to um, you know, touch on this now. So what are the elements of high performing paid content? Well, these are fairly obvious, but certainly worth remembering and considering. So a, one, a plus assets, we want to make sure that our visuals and our copy, just like on our organic content, are very high quality, that it's compelling. Otherwise, it's just an ad that's either ugly and in your face and really salesy, or it's just kind of vanilla and it feels like it wasn't created like a very good piece of content, a, a rich, compelling story or something that was value driven or, um, you know, resourceful, helpful, funny, shareable, all the things that make up, you know, A plus assets and, and both written and visual. Um, so important. Strong value proposition. So what's in it for your audience? Do I know why this matters to me and why this, why I should give a crap about this product that you're selling or this article that you're telling me to read? And that then, you know, leads us into the clear and concise call to action. So not only can I tell from your copy and your visual that this is for me and I should be interested, but what do I do next? D does the call to action make sense? Does it tell me read more, buy now, sign up immediately? You know, is there any scarcity or urgency or is it just straight up clear and concise? Really important. Strategic targeting, I'll say it again, who are we serving and why does it matter to them? So really being clear on our audience and, you know, why they should care and then um, targeting them accordingly, of course. And then placement and ad type. And this is particularly important when we get into the ad campaigns where we can have more or any kind of um, influence on the placement of that ad and the ad type. So now we're getting into those video ads and carousels and instant experiences, etc. Whereas if it's just promoted content, it's probably in the newsfeed and, um, you know, the ad type is a post of some kind, either that same looking square post that you'd put in the newsfeed uh, regularly if it wasn't boosted or an Instagram story or reel or whatever. So we want to do more of what's working and less of what's not. That goes without saying, but once we have a better sense of who our audience is, thanks to Facebook and Instagram insights, or maybe Google analytics as well, if you can pair those in there, that's really powerful. It's time to answer the question of why does some content drive more engagement than others? And this is where those anecdotal insights or information meets your analytical data insights. 
that you're listening, you're seeing, you can say, yeah, I know why that did well. Cause we always do well on Mondays or our video content kills it. Or people love it when our CEO weighs in and he's very, uh, you know, familiar sitting in his backyard. Um, but then in sites and analytically, we can see that actually also this works, this works, and this doesn't. So that's how we build our A plus material to connect with our audience, drive meaningful actions and drive down the cost of our ads because they perform well. They get clicked on, viewed, etc. Facebook is going to take your $20 no matter what. But if nobody likes that ad, nobody even touches it, it's going to get served less and less because Facebook does not want to serve up crappy paid or organic content. And again, it'll take your money and spend uh, and send it far and wide if it's a high performing piece of content. So we want to split test it just like with our organic. As I mentioned, you want to do this with your paid content. And this is something that gets overlooked so frequently. People don't take the time to test things, test different ad placements, different ad types, different audiences, be a student of your ads manager and your insights so that you can speak to why something did so well and why you need more budget for video ads or why you've got to pick up your socks because Regina's ad campaign did terribly, but Winnipeg was slaying it for like a dollar or less a click and Regina's were $6 a click. We have to see what's working and what's not and not just set it and forget it. That's the fastest way to burn your money on digital advertising. Setting measurable goals. Likewise, you got to know a little bit about the lay of the land before you can categorically say, this is my, um, my KPI or my key performance indicator, and this is what I need to happen. But it's not too difficult to do that after you've run a few campaigns or promoted posts. And it's actually kind of fun. Even if you're not a numbers person or someone that's so driven by data, when you start to see that your content is actually driving business results and you are now an asset like you've never believed or that your Instagram content is finally like monetizing itself in the form of sales and you can speak to why that is really rewarding. And it's not just about the revenue. It's about knowing that what you're doing is making a difference and people are loving it and they're acting on it. And it's not just likes, clicks and shares. It's like, holy smokes, I'm running ad campaigns that are the envy of everybody here. And that, you know, we had a million dollar budget for ads this year, which would be pretty incredible. And we drove $10 million worth of sales and my content was responsible for that. Now you're sales, marketing, business development, and practically CEO. So asking yourself a couple questions here. Uh, what monthly budget are you able to allocate to promoting or boosting your content on Facebook, then on Instagram, and then on LinkedIn? And this question is important to really think about and explore and push forward for all the reasons we've talked about. If there's no boost, no promoted content behind it, it's going to be tough to get it seen. It's the, it's the pay to play reality we live in. And then if we were to think about ad campaigns, this is getting ahead of ourselves because we haven't gotten there yet in module three, we will, but it's part of the budget discussion and decision. So if we're able to allocate anything to start running campaigns, ad campaigns on Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn, and then is there some Google ad budget in there too? You know, what's your total amount of paid reach now and what would you like it to be or do you think it needs to be in the year ahead? And this is a really important question to ask uh, and, and give yourself some goals. We've been in places at social school before where, you know, we'll run $1,000 worth of ads and sell $10,000 worth of tickets as a result to some conference or program or whatever. And that's that 10x return that we aim for. <laughs> and uh, when we get there, because we've really strategically mastered our targeting and built our campaigns properly with really A plus assets. It's addicting. <laughs> of course, we're like, well, how many more credit cards can we throw down to do this across 10 different programs or cities or events? Uh, and you might get there as well. And that's when, you know, you can feel really proud about the money or, or at least able to justify the fact that you're no longer, you know, printing stickers because every dollar you can allocate towards your Instagram ads and paid content is going to come back in a fivefold or tenfold way. So this is where that spreadsheet comes in. If you want to use it, no pressure. Um, it's called the ad campaign tracker and UTM tag builder. And it's got three tabs. The first one is where if you wanted, you could plot out your spending across your promoted posts in the top. That's the blue bar and your ad campaigns. That's the turquoise teal bar there. 
Um, you can do it by month if you want of like budgeted and then actual. And again, just kind of have an idea of what's being spent. And the reason that we've pulled this into a spreadsheet, which can also be, of course, a, a Google sheet to be dynamic and not some kind of hidden Excel file that only you have access to. Uh, but it's because if we just start randomly boosting things, we don't really know where we're at. And we don't know how that's cut into our ad campaign budget, for example, or vice versa. So being really aware of like in week one, two, three, four of the month ahead, January, what's my promoted post budget for Facebook? And what is it for Instagram? And how does this change throughout the year or as I get data? Uh, and, and more importantly for ad campaigns, you're probably boosting posts consistently throughout the year, just like you're creating content consistently throughout the year. But where do your ad campaign spends hop up? Because it's a campaign. You're promoting your back to school sale or your Christmas offering or whatever, your life jacket awareness week campaign. So of course those are probably going to fluctuate and you need to have that at a glance. The next one, tab two, is planning and managing your ad campaigns with this ad campaign tracker. The other one, budget, this one more so, what are you saying, to who, when, for how long, <laughs> and in what month. Um, and we've laid this out for you in the cold, warm, and hot um, method that we use. You'll learn more about this in a minute in module three. But basically everything here that you could need to at a glance, see what your ad campaigns are about, not your promoted posts, because that uh, is different <laughs> and simpler, but your ad campaigns um, and when they're running. The third tab is tracking for success, and that's your UTM tags, those urchin tracking mechanism tags that add that lengthy piece of script to the back of your URL. So when you go to promote that post, or build that ad campaign and the question almost before you push publish, the last question is, what's the URL you're sending people to here, please? Oh, it's bestbuy.com forward slash tripods. And then there's an, a question mark and everything after that question mark becomes code that you're creating in a tracking sheet like this. And the final column there is uh, column 10 where it says tagged URL that has a formula to it. So don't mess with that column. But if you fill out all the other yellow columns, four through nine, and you follow the instructions at the top of steps one through 10, it will create, it will automatically populate that lengthy tagged URL for you. Why does it matter? Well, just like you can see in the instructions, if you open this up and read it, now you're not just seeing in Google Analytics, that's the whole point of this, is we wanna go into Google Analytics and not just see how much of our traffic came from Facebook, but how much each post, each boosted post, each organic post, each ad campaign drove. And, and then even more so, if you have it set up, you can see then which of those led to sales if you have your goals set up in Google Analytics. So we're getting more data, we're using UTM tags properly. You can see when you go to build an ad campaign or even a con piece of content in Facebook, that it'll say, do you wanna use our UTM tag builder, which is great. It uses the exact same parameters of like naming the campaign, naming the audience. It'll spit out your UTM tag. The problem with that is that you don't have them all at a glance to then refer back to. So when I go into Google Analytics, I'm like, wait, what was that UTM tag? So this is a way of mapping them all in one place if you need it. If you're only boosting four posts a quarter and running one campaign a quarter, you probably don't need a reference tracker like this, but it's up to you. And don't be overwhelmed by that. If you're not at all ready for UTM tags, no worries. It took me like eight years of being a digital marketer to finally go, okay, fine, I can entertain those now. And when way back my pal Adam said to me, who's a very sophisticated full-time digital advertiser, Kelly, if you're not using UTM tags in every post, organic and paid, it's not even worth posting. And I was like, well, like dare to disagree uh, because content was the most important thing at that time and some more generic tracking, the insights that I was getting from Facebook itself. And as I became more sophisticated or we started needing more information and more data on the back end to justify for clients or to justify our own spending, then UTM tags became applicable. But don't worry if you're not there yet. You can always refer back to this uh, later on when you are. Okay, so to end module two, this very long module, I promise you that module three is shorter. Uh, you're going to, if you can, 
map out who belongs in your top of funnel, middle of funnel, and bottom of funnel ad cam or audiences, I should say, and then go build them in Facebook Audience Manager. Now is your time. Get those things cleaned up. Start from scratch if you want. Start an entirely new um, audience set. Delete the old ones if you have to, and uh, watch those demos: the cold audience creation video, the warm audience creation video, and the hot audience creation video, as well as the micro geo target audience creation. Then exercise four, determine how many posts you'll boost across which platforms each month and for which budget, what budget. And exercise five, what individual posts might you boost? You can use that. Maybe you're not ready to do that just yet, but as you go forward in the coming weeks, as you're creating more content, you can actually map out these posts um, that you'll be boosting. So there you have it. That's your, um, your cold exercise your warm audience building exercise and your hot audience building exercise. And of course, remembering here that you're first declaring on paper who belongs in those categories before you go into audience manager to build them. It's really helpful to narrow it down on paper because once you get in there, sky's the limit and Facebook's going to give you 500 options and interest to choose from. So it's better if in advance you've declared the parameters of that audience. And then the bonus there at the bottom is if you're ready, to go into Facebook business suite and ads or sorry, audience manager and build them out, then I encourage you to do so. And you should be able to do that after you watch those demo videos. Then that monthly boosted post planner. If you want to use this instead of the spreadsheet that I showed you, or in addition to great, this might be, you know, the good starting point, And then you move into the actual tracking on that spreadsheet as you're going or as you're boosting. And then likewise, if you are working backwards as you're creating your content for the month ahead and you're trying to decide which boost uh, or where, or what audience and for what budget each post gets boosted, this would be a good place to do that. I will see you in module three, the final stage of this certificate as well as this course. And we will look deeper at, at uh, ad campaigns and um, just the overall engagement and insights picture. I will see you there.